Gamers. They say hope begins in the dark, but most just flail around in the blackness, searching for their destiny. When Pitch Black released in the year 2000, moviegoers were treated to a flawed yet entertaining slice of science fiction. Its plot, which saw a crew of interstellar travelers band together to survive a hostile planet, was formulaic, but its setting and cast captured the imagination of many. And no other character in its cast did so better than Richard B. Riddick. An enigmatic anti-hero portrayed by Vin Diesel, Riddick's mixture of smarts and physical abilities proved surprisingly popular, and all but guaranteed that audiences would be seeing him once more on the silver screen. Few could have predicted that on the eve of his next cinematic appearance, a little-known Swedish game developer called Starbreeze would release an expertly crafted video game starring the anti-hero, and that it would prove more popular than the movie it released alongside. This game was Escape from Butcher Bay, a stealth-centric action title that followed Riddick's numerous attempts to escape from a maximum security prison using whatever means necessary. While circumstances surrounding its release prevented Butcher Bay from being as massive of a success as Starbreeze wanted it to be, its critical acclaim put the studio on the map, and before long, a follow-up called Assault on Dark Athena made its way to market. The latter featured a higher emphasis on action over stealth and ended up being less well-received. But its reception did little to sully its predecessor's legacy, or prevent the people who made it from eventually going on to do bigger, better things. This is the video game history of the Chronicles of Riddick. Come and get me. To most movie-going audiences, Vin Diesel is the epitome of the modern-day action hero. Almost all of his major motion picture releases depict him as the mighty consolidation of suave and street smarts, a brooding yet affable hunk of a man who lives his life a quarter mile at a time. But when the cameras aren't rolling, most of his inner circle would tell you that Diesel's also a huge geek. Growing up, he indulged in tabletop and video games like Dungeons and & Dragons and Tekken. And for almost as long as he'd had a career in Hollywood, he tried to pay tribute to these pastimes while making movie magic. For a period of time, most of these game-making ambitions were managed by Tygon Studios. Established by Diesel in 2002, Tygon came into being at the same time that the actor was getting ready to start production on his second Riddick film, The Chronicles of Riddick, and was quickly tasked with managing the development of its video game tie-in, Escape from Butcher Bay. The latter had entered production just before The Chronicles of Riddick was greenlit, and been assigned to a scarcely known Swedish developer called Starbreeze Studios. Starbreeze had its origins in the Nordic demo scene. Its founder, Magnus Hogdal, was a member of a Swedish demo group called Triton, and had used his years of programming experience within the demo scene to build much of the studio's technological infrastructure after establishing it. After failing to bring a role-playing game called Sorcery to market, Starbreeze merged with another Swedish studio called O3 Entertainment and developed Enclave, a hack-and-slash action game set within a dark fantasy world. Enclave received decent reviews and managed to earn the studio a modicum of international attention, but its staff regretted the way it had come together. In a 2018 retrospective on Kotaku UK on the making of Butcher Bay, Starbreeze's Jens Andersson would recall how most of the team crunched like crazy during much of Enclave's development and made an endless number of mistakes trying to get its gameplay into a workable state. When the dust settled following its release, everyone agreed that their next production needed to be far better. Initially, the team approached Vivendi to develop a Lord of the Rings game, believing that its experience working in the realm of high fantasy made it an ideal candidate to take on Tolkien's esteemed fiction. Vivendi, however, believed that the studio would be better served developing a game based on the Riddick IP, which it had recently obtained the publishing rights to, and pitched Starbreeze on the prospect of doing so. The studio consented, and Escape from Butcher Bay entered into production for the Xbox and PlayStation 2.
From the project's beginning, it was clear to Starbreeze's staff that there was little to gain from trying to emulate the movies they would be basing it on, or attempting to stick to one style of experience. The game would take place from a first-person perspective, but it wouldn't just be a first-person shooter, it would be a hand-to-hand -hand combat game, a horror game, a puzzle game, a role-playing game, and a stealth game as well. Thanks to an impressive demo that was fashioned in a matter of months, convincing its partners at Vivendi and Tygon that this was a good idea was easy. Turning this demo into a finished product was a different story. Even though everyone knew what they were setting out to achieve, the team was forced time and time again to confront all manner of obstacles and problems on the road to its completion. Many of these problems were fairly unique to the circumstances under which they were operating and the movies that they were working with. For example, while the team knew that Butcher Bay didn't have to follow the events of either Pitch Black or the Chronicles of Riddick, they didn't know right away when it would take place in the series' timeline, and by extension, if it would make chronological sense to show Riddick obtaining abilities that he's shown to already possess by the time of Pitch Black, such as his distinctive eye shine. Likewise, when it came to the character of Riddick himself, the team was unsure how they were going to properly highlight his presence. The game needed to take place in first person so that all of its gameplay systems would function as intended, but it also needed to emphasize that Riddick was behind this first person camera in order to fully make players buy that they were indeed playing as him, and ensure that the studio's hard work on his character model didn't go to waste. In the case of the latter, Starbreeze ended up devising a novel camera system that allowed it to shift into third person every time Riddick did a variety of non-violent actions, as well as made it so that players could see Riddick's lower body when they looked down. Implementing these features took a considerable amount of work, but everyone agreed that getting them done was the right call. At the same time that it was dealing with all of these frustrations, however, the team also enjoyed an extremely amicable relationship with Tygon and all of the Hollywood talent that the latter connected it with. When Vin Diesel sat down to record Riddick's lines, for example, the actor treated the occasion with a high degree of professionality, spending a considerable amount of time making sure that his lines sounded as good as possible. This relationship came to a head about six months before the game's release. By this point in time, several other projects that Starbreeze had been working on concurrently to Butcher Bay had been cancelled, and a hefty portion of its staff had been let go. Those who were still on board were no less determined to complete the game than ever, but the game was still in rough shape, and when Vivendi reviewed it, the publisher decided to outright cancel it. Before this decision could be set in stone, however, Starbreeze's American associates stepped in and managed to convince Vivendi to let development on the Xbox version of the game run its course. The PlayStation 2 version was dropped, but Butcher Bay, and by extension Starbreeze, were saved. Despite all of this, excitement for Escape from Butcher Bay was low when it arrived on store shelves in the summer of 2004. In an interview with GamesIndustry.biz in 2009, Tygon's Ian Stevens would recall how players had nearly every reason to be unenthused by Starbreeze's opus. It was a movie game starring an actor they weren't sure they liked. It was a developer that people hadn't really heard of, and it was a publisher that didn't have a reputation for quality. It's for these reasons that when players finally gave Butcher Bay a shot, most were taken aback by how great it was. Its performances were outstanding, its environments oozed with dark personality, and its manic mix of gameplay styles were consistently entertaining, with many taking particular delight in the game's stealth elements. Going through vents, shooting out lights, and sneaking up behind enemies without being noticed was incredibly exciting, as well as deeply rewarding. On a larger scale, what arguably impressed players the most about Butcher Bay was how deftly it balanced making them feel in control of their environment and making them feel utterly at the mercy of it. Inhabiting Riddick's frame felt badass and dominant, but never so dominant that the scariness of his adversaries or the situations that he found himself in failed to hit home. That Butcher Bay was over fairly quickly and lacked a multiplayer mode were some of the only big criticisms players had of it. In his GamesIndustry.biz interview, Ian Stevens would also admit that from his perspective, someone who had stakes in both the games industry and Hollywood, it was more than a little weird to see Starbreeze's game review really well, and to see the Chronicles of Riddick review really poorly. But these small quibbles did little to sully its overall reception.
For Starbreeze, the success of Butcher Bay was a Pyrrhic victory. Its name was now firmly on the map as a studio worthy of praise. But because of Xbox's limited install base and the game's even more limited marketing, much of this praise failed to translate into sales. Not wanting to go under, Starbreeze quickly signed on to develop The Darkness for 2K games. The latter ended up being less well received than Butcher Bay, but managed to perform well enough at retail to keep Starbreeze afloat for a while longer. Following this, the studio tried to get a number of original video game concepts off the ground, including a game about mind reading called Kano and a post-apocalyptic action title called Polaris. After much ado, however, the studio ended up being assigned by Vivendi to return to the Riddick universe and develop a remake of Butcher Bay for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. Even though it was still only a few years after the game's original release, the opportunity was ripe to give it a fresh coat of paint. Microsoft had been unable to make the 360 backwards compatible with the original Xbox release of Butcher Bay, and getting it onto the PlayStation 3 as well would open it up to an even greater audience than before. Moreover, Starbreeze was eager to add on to its opus. Its staff wanted to provide players with as much bang for their buck, and add a bonus chapter to the end of its campaign, titled Assault on Dark Athena, that would see Riddick attempt to flee an interstellar mercenary vessel after escaping from Butcher Bay. As time passed, however, it became apparent that they could do so much more with the project if they made this bonus chapter even bigger. One thing led to another and Starbreeze decided to expand Dark Athena into its own campaign, separate from Butcher Bay. And then, as if this wasn't enough, the studio decided to also add in a multiplayer component. The latter had been a long time coming for the series. Vin Diesel wanted Butcher Bay to have one since its inception, and Starbreeze had deeply considered heeding his desires during its development but ultimately decided against doing so, out of fear that it would hamper its single-player campaign's progression. After its release, however, the team took great note of how fans of the first game also wanted multiplayer, and when the opportunity presented itself once more during Dark Athena's development to implement such a feature, it struck them as a no-brainer to finally do it. Towards the end of Dark Athena's development, the studio was taken for a spin when Vivendi announced that it was merging with Activision and dropping the game's publishing rights. For a brief, yet excruciating period, the sequel's future laid in limbo. Until out of the blue, Atari announced that it would be publishing the game in Vivendi's place, and Starbreeze emerged no worse for wear. In an interview with Destructoid ahead of the game's launch, a representative of the studio claimed that if anything, the transfer to Atari helped them out more, as it gave them even more time to polish their work even further. As a result, when Assault on Dark Athena finally released in April of 2009, fans were disappointed to discover that for all this talk, Starbreeze's sophomore effort felt in many regards like a step down from Butcher Bay. Its visuals, voice acting, and overall level of polish were just as slick as its predecessors, but its overall design was several notches less interesting. Instead of weaving in and out of different sections of a prison using a varying mix of stealth and straight-up combat, Dark Athena presented a much more straightforward shooter, one that was bereft of many interesting supporting characters and lacking in imagination. Its multiplayer also wasn't especially beloved, though many players ended up gravitating towards a mode in the latter called Pitch Black, which involved one player attempting to sneak around in the dark as Riddick, and the rest attempting to flush Riddick out using a combination of flashlights, guns, and strategy. After the release of Dark Athena, Starbreeze partnered itself with EA and was put to work on a first-person reinvention of the Syndicate series. Its development proved grueling for both parties, and eventually most of the studio's key staff departed the company to form Machine Games. The latter was subsequently purchased by Bethesda and put to work on the Wolfenstein series, beginning with 2014's Wolfenstein The New Order. The Riddick series has been all but missing in action from the video game industry in the meantime, despite promises years ago that it would be continued unabated. During the marketing blitz surrounding the release of Riddick Rule the Dark in 2013, Diesel claimed that no less than two new Riddick titles were on the way. 
The first would be a mobile game, while the second would be a proper follow-up to Starbreeze's titles that would be developed by many of the former team members behind Butcher Bay and Dark Athena. In an interview with IGN, Diesel claimed that the latter would be more an MMO-esque experience and would be centered around the mercenary trade within the Riddick universe. While an unusual move, Diesel's desire to explore the massively multiplayer genre wasn't without precedent. In the years leading up to this reveal, the actor had been trying to kickstart an MMO about the historical conquests of Hannibal Barca, called Barca BC. In the end, however, both MMOs would be lost to time, and the only new Riddick game that would see the light of day would be the mobile game Riddick Merc Files. Set on a generic dune-covered planet, Merc Files offered a simple assortment of stealth-based objectives to complete as the eye-shining anti-hero, and not much else. While it remains to be seen whether Merc Files will go down as its franchise's last video game adaptation, it's unlikely that the world will receive anything on the same scale as Starbreeze's titles ever again. Vin Diesel has remained no less motivated to continue the Riddick saga since the release of Rule the Dark, and provided ample evidence to suggest that a fourth film may yet materialize. If this film were to finally enter production, there would theoretically be no better time for another Riddick game to be greenlit. But most Hollywood productions today are seldom accompanied by video games as lavishly produced as Butcher Bay or Dark Athena. And almost all of the brain trust who helped bring the former two into existence are currently busy reinventing the Wolfenstein series for Bethesda. Ultimately, Starbreeze's Riddick titles will likely go down in history as a time capsule of an era gone by. Of a period when mainstream movies were joined by big-budget video game tie-ins, and the quality of these tie-ins could prove incredibly surprising. Embrace the darkness. Thank you for watching. We'd like to take this time to thank, by name, the generous patrons who have pledged to our Hall of Fame reward tier. Maktoum Saeed Al Maktoum, Paul Cousino, and those currently subscribed to our producer reward tier. Dari Rap Sikurtson, EmuMovies.com, Lame Game Man, Milkshake, Schizo Lingbo. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and backing us on Patreon.